I just wanted to let you know some of the reasons why we recorded the conversation with Karen Beluso from Steinway. It's really important to me to share my appreciation for music and to show and expose musicians and how they think about music, how important it can be in our lives, how it can transform us, how we can become more relaxed, more at ease, whatever you're looking to get out of it, music can bring so much into your life. And there's no really clear cut path unless you're trying to play a musical instrument of how do I learn more about music? How do I learn to appreciate music more? How do I get lessons and how to listen to music? Um, all of these avenues are things that I'm trying to open up to the people at Pure Audio Video, to, the, to our clients, to our friends, to our family, so that they can value this incredible experience that most people take for granted. I would imagine that you picked up music very, very early. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like? Like when did, when did that first, I don't know if you can't remember it, but just when do you kind of remember, you know, that you heard some music or you tried to play some music and something inside you just kind of changed? You know, I, I don't have that moment, you know, just like, you know, pow, you know, that that's when it happened. But what I do know is that I was surrounded. Um, there was music always playing in the house. Um, and so, you know, I, I and it was whatever, you know, the, the top 40 was of the time in the late 60s, early 70s. And then my father loved, you know, the, the big band era. So we were, they were always playing music in the house. Um, I was an only child. So what started, I think, to happen was that, you know, I'd hear the music and on my little toy piano, I would try and poke out the tune that I was hearing. Um, and then after that, you know, it went to, I learned how to um, operate the turntable. <laughs> and so I would, you know, if my parents, you know, weren't, you know, weren't, didn't put music on, I'd go and put the records on. And then, then I must have seen something either in a cartoon or something about conducting. So I would conduct the music that I heard. And then I kept begging my parents for a real piano. So it, I think it was just something that was just always a part of my life, you know, that, that, that just, you know, um, I was in this cocoon of music um, and just it, it, you know, wrapped me up <laughs> and hasn't let go since. Interesting. Were any of your, any of your family uh, musicians? Not a bit. Not a bit. Um, my parents were were not at all. They both. My mother grew up during World War II in Asia, so certainly, you know, she didn't have that opportunity. They enjoyed music. You know, they loved listening. They had nice voices. I think my father's sister um, may have played an instrument, but really, nobody did. But they they had a real love of music. And what did so love of music? So they would just. It was always on. Mm -hmm. how would how would they listen was it like was it background music or was they would they really get would they would they kind of mix it up where there were some times where they were just you know eyes closed just experiencing right. it was it you know what was it that, was a mix what that like? it, it was, was a mix, mix. Okay. also um you know i'm i'm what in my 50s so that was also the time when on television there were a lot of variety shows um, everybody had a variety show, you know, Dinah Shore, Andy Williams, you know, all of those great, and they all had music as a part of it, a, a huge part of it. And so it was always part of like whatever night it was, whether it was a Friday night, Saturday night, um, you know, my mother loved the Lawrence Welk show. So I grew up watching that every Saturday night, we'd sit down and watch that show show and that show had a wonderful variety of music from the top 40 to polka music to you know light classical so I was exposed to it all in that and we'd sit down as a family to watch it so it was a bit of a mix you know it was often you know and it was always um on the radio in the car you know I knew what my I knew which favorites were my father's I knew which you know were my mother's favorites things like that so um you know we talked about it I don't think they actually knew what they were getting into when they sent me to for piano lessons um, because classical music, they had an appreciation for it, but they were just like, we, we don't quite get this. Um, but, you know, they supported it. Um, I mean, it was funny. My mother didn't even realize, and I found it in her collection of LPs. She bought Van Cliburn's recording from the Tchaikovsky competition, that debut recording. 
and I found it in her collection and I, it was still wrapped. And, and so I said to her, you know, I was like maybe seven. So by then I already started to know because I'd already been about a year into lessons. And I said to her, I said, you have this. Do you know who this is? And she said, yeah, you know, he won that big competition. I said, did you ever listen to it? She's like, no, but it's what everybody did. So it was part of the pop culture, I guess, at the time, you know, a little bit. He was a big hero. So she just bought it because that's what everybody else was doing. Meanwhile, I was like, do you know what this is? <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm like, I'm opening it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember listening to it for the first time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, a whole new world opened. Yeah. It was just, it was a revelation to me. Um, just the fact that, you know, you could play with an orchestra, that you had all of this support. And then just the, the emotion of the music. Um, and I think also I understood, I perceived what that meant also um, in a political sense. You know, it was like, I knew that he was an American who won a Russian competition and I, I knew that that wasn't supposed to be the way it went. You know, that he was, um, you know, the big hero uh, for us. So I think all of that just combined and it was just such an emotional experience um, to hear that piece. How, when did you, I mean, so this was like a year or so into your piano lessons. Mm -hmm. When did you mm -hmm. start to realize that you were, that you had a talent that, that could really be developed, that it wasn't just something you were doing because you liked it? Um, you know, I, I was truly blessed with a fabulous teacher who started me from the very beginning. And she was, you know, she's probably one of the greatest educators, music educators I've ever come across because she was always teaching and opening up a whole new world. She never talked down to her students. She would explain things, you know, but she always, you know, classical music, music in general was just at this level that we all aspired to. And because it was so beautiful, um, you know, I think she says, you know, what did I know? You know, I was just a, a little six-year-old, but she says that I progressed pretty quickly so that by the time I was like, you know, almost eight years old, she sensed that there was something, um, you know, that she could, you know, really, there was something different, you know, that I had a gift that way. Um, you know, for me, it was, you know, once I got like a real piano, I was like, oh, cool. Now I can, you know, these notes tell me that I can play a tune. And so it was like learning, you know, it really was learning a new language, learning to read. It was another way that I could express myself. It was just, these it sounds like these worlds kept opening up for you your teacher was amazing and you just kept it was more exploration for you you yeah. were just super excited about exploring more of it yeah yeah and and it became you know again like i said you know i was an only child so this this was like you know my playroom so to speak you know i i didn't i don't know if i didn't want a lot of toys or i wasn't interested in them you know but this is what i loved you know once this book was opened, it was like there was no turning back for me um, because there were great stories, you know, great stories of, of composers. There were great stories of um, operas, you know, there just the whole sound that you could create. You know, it was like, um, I often use this analogy in my own teaching, you know, when you're a beginning uh, music student, you have like the eight box of Crayola crayons yeah. that has only the primary colors. And then as you progress, you get the bigger box until you can get the, the 64 colors. And that was like, you know, the biggest thing, of course, kids nowadays want an iPhone 11. I just wanted that box of 64 crayons <laughs> with the sharpener. <laughs> you know, but that was what it was, it, you know, just these colors that just, in, you know, were, um, I, I really, and the truth. Did it ever, did it ever get to the point where it felt like because I, I think it, I'm getting the sense with you that obviously you had a lot of musical talent, but it was cultivated in the right way mm -hmm. so that you kept getting more and more engaged with it and deeper into it and interested in it. Did it, did it ever get to the point where it felt like this is, this is work or this is not fun or this is just kind of, you know, I'm not sure about this or was it always just this? Never. Never. No. Okay. Never, never. It was, um, you know, I think more of the challenges, you know, where it was like, you know, when I faced that were more just me wanting to play better, me wanting to be able, you know, 
wanting to grow as a musician, as an artist, um, you know, and, and learning how to do that. Um, you know, I mean, even to this day, you know, you'd think by, by now, it's like, I've done this all my life, you know, you'd kind of become jaded and, and cynical about things. But, you know, there, I, I was just at, up at the Newport Jazz Festival and it was live. Okay, so, and, and just think, you know, the artists have been holed up in, you know, uh, in, in their studios for a year and a half. And so now for the artists to come out on stage and play and feel, you know, the, the vibes of, of the people listening, it was electric. And, and to be out there, you know, out on a beautiful summer day, um, you know, in Newport, Rhode Island, right by the water, um, it, Every time I, you know, sometimes I close my eyes, I'd see different colors. Other times I just gaze at the clouds while the music was playing. And it was just, again, this is what I've fallen in love with. This is what, you know, what I love to do and, and what gives me great joy, which I hope in turn, as a performer, I do the same for my audience. How, how much, I, there's, like, there's a lot to go into here, but how, how much do you feel that learning to play music better and perform better is like correlates to your ability to listen to music and appreciate it and understand what you're listening to. Oh, there's a direct correlation. Um, I think, you know, uh, certainly from the time I was little, you know, there were certain things, just even just technical things that I, I'd be like, wow, you know, that person who's older than me can do that. So then now, hopefully by now, I can do those things, but now I have a greater appreciation of what um, somebody else does, you know, and how they go about it, how they, you know, how everybody imbues their performance with their personality and, and, and just how a, a little bit different it is. You know, I, I came out of there, you know, it, it was perfect timing for this podcast, um, you know, because even before I, I got your, your um, you know, just kind of ideas about it, I was sitting there at this event and um, just thinking about these things. Um, but one of the things that struck me was that here I hear the great R&B singer Mavis Staples. The woman is 82 years old and just the sounds and the energy on stage that came across um, were just, you know, they just filled me up with such joy. And I remember saying to my friend saying, when I'm 82, I wanna bring that much joy to my audience. That's, in that's inspiring and and it's definitely like a, a great goal. How do you, when you're performing, Karen, how do you, how do you feel? Cause I know classical music, a little different from jazz, very mm -hmm. different from, from rock and right, right. other forms of music where people are yelling and screaming mm -hmm. and singing mm -hmm. along. How do you feel the energy of the audience when you're performing and what, what is it that you're trying to do when you're performing to connect with that audience? If I've done my job, as a performer and as an artist, I have basically a map that I want or a journey that I want to take my audience on. Okay, so from, you know, in terms of how I approach pieces, how I program uh, my recitals and performances. So that I want them to at least come out with certain points. Um, sometimes that, that changes in the performance. Um, and it, it's kind of a weird thing to explain. We, you know, there's the technical aspect of playing um, and then there's the artistic. So the technical has to support the artistic, right? Uh, um, so you have to be able to get around in order to do what you want to hear and, and, and get across to your audience. But sometimes there's like a feeling in the room. Um, you can feel, you know, the silence, yet you feel that the attention or, or the tension in the room depends, you know, on how it feels. Um, I've often felt at the end of a piece, like the quietest moment sometimes when I'm ending a piece, that really has hit home with me with the statement, you're holding the audience in the palm of your hand. You as the performer determine when you're going to stop that sound and when you're going to end that experience for them. And oftentimes I can feel that. I can feel, I can hear the sigh. I can hear the relief. Um, you know, so I know when I feel that or hear that, I know that I've done my job. Um, I think also, 
changing, at least for me um, as a performer, changing my approach to live performance. You know, back in the day it was, you know, and it still is oftentimes, you know, 80 to 90% of the time, you walk on stage, you take your bow, you play. There's no real engagement with the audience, right? Um, so, you know, unless it's a different type of situation when I'm giving a recital, I immediately, you know, speak to the audience. I kind of break that wall, um, you know, and invite them to join me on, and oftentimes I'll say, please join me on this musical journey. Um, and by then, then you've invited them to this experience with you. Um, you know, so that's what I hope to be able to, to do. And, um, you know, by then, then you really do get a sense of, you know, the room. That's really, really smart to do that. I wish more, um, I wish they changed up that, you know, kind of formality in classical music, even like, for example, you don't, everybody in that audience, I guess it's, do they assume that people who are going to hear Tchaikovsky's fourth have a really good understanding of the story of it and right because not everybody does sometimes you're no. going there for the first time or you've never heard that piece it would be great to just get a what what should I be listening for what should what do you want me to experience give me a preview of it so that right. as I'm listening to it maybe for the first time or maybe it's only the third time I can appreciate it more yeah I, I've always felt that you know, they spend, <laughs> concert producers spend so much money on the playbill. Who really reads it? Yeah. You know, these days we're buzzing into the concert. We barely get to our seats. You don't have time to read this wonderfully, you know, beautifully written scholarly article on this piece. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can't, I feel that as performers today, we can't assume that our audience has prior knowledge. Um, I think we have to err on the other side and assume that our knowledge, our audiences that are coming are new to this. Um, and ever since I started doing that, probably about like 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, just kind of breaking that wall with the audience and just saying, hey, you know, I want you to listen to a couple of things here. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's what we used to, what we call the lecture recital, you know, in grad school, but it's, you know, maybe not as formal you know, in terms of saying, here's the structure, here's this, but saying, you know, composer wrote this, you know, here are a couple of things, you know, to listen for, um, you know, this will help you sort it out. Um, I can't tell you how many people, even those who already, you know, who are frequent concert goers to classical music have said to me, you know, thank you for doing that. You know, it helped to focus where we were listening. And, and then all, then they enjoyed it because they knew, they understood it. It's huge. You know, it's huge. It's it's absolutely important to do. Um, so yeah, I do feel yeah. that that's something really that has to be. You know, yeah, it really is. Um, you know, even you know, you think back in the early '60s, late '50s, you had Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concerts. Um, you know, which were also then preserved. Um, you know, on video. Um, that's what I feel we need. <laughs> but it's our job as the performers in the live experience to do that. 100%, 100%. You're, you're, you're in control of the experience. That's why we're going to see your performance, right? Because, mm -hmm. right. And the more you can bring us into that performance, the better, the better it's going to be. And classical music is so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So when you first started learning piano, piano, when you started listening to classical music, you were taught how to listen to it, how to appreciate mm -hmm. it, what to mm -hmm. listen for, right? Most people mm -hmm. don't don't get that education. They don't get that experience. So exactly, it's super important, especially you know in school. There's less music education. There's less emphasis on that. It's super important if we want to engage a wider audience, right? To to mm -hmm. get us to bring us into your world and teach us how to appreciate it. Right. I mean, there was a a friend of mine shared um, something at, at, at one of my recent concerts before the pandemic. And I programmed um, the Brahms Handel variation. So it's, you know, theme and 24 variations and a fugue. So, you know, it, it's a solid piece, you know, a solid like 28 minutes 
nonstop, right? And um, so I made sure, you know, uh, that I prepared the audience for this. So there, there were some some children, like middle school age, you know, or late elementary, fourth and fifth graders, and they were sitting with um, a friend of mine, and um, she was their music teacher. But I made sure I said, look, there are, you know. Here are 24 variations. A variation is, you know, uh, like here, you know, and I explained to them, here's a sentence, the dog ran, you know, I do the whole thing. The brown dog ran. Well, that's a variation on the original sentence. So I explained to them how this all works. I play the theme and I said, this is the theme. And now you're going to hear the composer change it 24 times. And I said, and I want to see if you can get to the end with me and, and count, find all the variations. So there were twin brothers who really don't listen to classical music. And it gave them something to do. They didn't even know by the end of it that they had been listening to a piece for a half an hour. They were listening really carefully to find the beginning and ends of each of the variations, you know? And they did, they came up to me and they're like, we did it, we found all of them, we ended with you. <laughs> that's, yeah, see that, and that's the kind of engagement that you need. And like, it's almost like you gave them a puzzle, right? You gave, yeah. and you said, see if you can find, see if you can find how, how all of them fit together. Yeah, you know, and that was the, their first experience with that. You know, I do hope that they'll go back and, and listen to it again, you know, but at least they know it's not that classical music is alive, that it's not a museum piece and you just look at it from afar, that it's still something that you can experience that moves the performer and hopefully if we do our jobs correctly, the people listening. You know, that there's a human aspect, you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, I thought classical musicians were, you know, kind of snobby and, and you know, and elite and, and it's like, but you're down to earth. And I'm like, well, the composers were, so why shouldn't we be, you know? I, yeah, I think that's what most people miss. I know when I was talking to Barry and Cosmo, they, they, they made the same point about that. All of these classical music composers were not you know, living in some ivory tower intellectuals, right? They were they no. were writing music for the people. Yeah, and you know, especially by the time you know you have like the you know classical and late classical with you know Mozart and Beethoven, certainly, it's for the people. That was the popular music of the time, you know, and that's what I try to you know when I'm working with students or any group, I'm like, this is what you know if they had a radio, this is what they'd be hearing. This they didn't, so this is what they heard. And you know. what, do you, what do you think was lost um, was lost in translation over the years with classical music? Like, why do you think it moved away from being the music for the people? Well, I think, again, it became, you know, classical music was a reflection of the times, you know? So uh, when you listen to romantic music, you can hear all of the, the changes from nationalism to, you know, uh, in, impressionism, all of this. And then you get into the 20th century. And I don't know that we necessarily, as, as classical music, had an identity. It kept changing, right? You know, you, not to mention you had two world wars. But I think when we started to go away from, you know, the experiment with um, moving as far away from tonality as possible, I think that was unsettling to many people. And, you know, uh, for me, you know, I realized that it, it really and truly is an academic exercise, um, you know, and so I frame it as such, um, you know, not to, uh, you know, uh, not to belittle anything that was written, you know, during the, uh, the 12 tone period um, in 20th century music, but uh, I think, you know, you have to approach it differently. And I don't think people always took the time to explain it. Again, that taking that time to educate, it suddenly went to this very, you know, that's when classical music went into the ivory tower, you know, th at that point. And I think then, you know, then you had the evolution of all the other popular genres that were just coming fast and furious, um, you know, that, um, you know, by then we, we lost our footing. And, and I think also kind of dug our heels in, um, you know, and so now we're facing that, um, you know, that challenge of bringing younger people in who, who have not yet been exposed, um, you know, so that they're not just doing it because they think it's the thing to do because it looks good, you know, to be seen at the symphony, you know, right. to be seen at the opera, that this really is, you know, an art, a creative experience. Uh, my first experience, I mean, I, I went to the symphony when I was young and it just never, like, I enjoyed it, but it never, 
it never really grabbed me. I got into classical music much later. Mm -hmm. So I think just listening to, um, I had to be ready for it, I guess. I had mm -hmm. to be open, I had to be open to it. But I think that would have changed if I had also found maybe the right, the right uh, friend who was into mm -hmm. it or the right teacher who was into it um, to just show me what, what I was missing, show me what was there. But I do, I do right. think it's, it's interesting to, when you go and you hear somebody, a symphony or a concert pianist perform live, it does have a different effect. Like it moves you mm -hmm. much more powerfully than listening to it over the radio or listening to oh, yeah. it over a pair of headphones. Yeah. It's just, it's a totally different experience. Yeah, to see like in a symphony orchestra, to see 80, 90, 100 people you know, who have different parts to play, yet what you're hearing is the combination of all of that sound, you know, yet if you were to have them play separately, they're not playing the same parts. So you're getting this huge, you know, just picture, sonic, you know, picture. Um, you know, when you see a soloist, I always, you know, the Olympics are happening now. So I always um, liken that, you um, to the Olympics, you know, for a solo performer to be on stage for two hours, that is their Olympic moment. You know, you see the, you know, the mental fortitude, you know, as well as the technical. Yeah. Um, but I think as much as possible, you know, we have so, so many, um, so many parallel activities these days that I think if we can find, you know, for our friends, for our students, for, you know, our peers that we're introducing, you know, as we introduce them to classical music, to be able to draw the parallels to their lives or to their interests, um, I think then that's when you find the common ground. It's meeting people where they are. I think the, cha the challenge for me, at least with Pure Audio Video, is it seems like people, not seems, people are, we're so busy and so... I'm going to say distracted for because I think that's fairly accurate, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. your notific it's your 5 million notifications on your phone. It's email. It's whatever's on whatever's streaming here and there. Music is kind of like background noise, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it almost feels like we have to relearn how to put away, like spend some time, put away all the other stuff and just sit down and listen to it and experience it and rediscover what's there. Right, well, I mean, that's the same thing with all of the, um, you know, self-care, you know, that, that's that been going on. You know, taking that time to just be quiet with yourself. We don't do that as a society. It's very yeah. uncomfortable for us. And that's the same type, you know, that's the same um, mental attitude, you know, that you have to have when you're listening to music you know, truly listening, actively listening, not just background music, um, you know, and, and bit by bit, you hope that, that, that people start to do that. Um, I mean, I was interesting. I, I found out, you know, that I started hearing things in, in different ways, um, you know, as a performer, when I, when I would stop and um, when I stopped and grounded myself. Um, because oftentimes what, what happens, at least for me, is that I'll hear, it's like a recording playing in my head of what I want to be happening at that performance. Okay, then, then you have to learn as a performer how not just to go by that, but to also understand what's happening right at that moment. So it, it's like, like you're in two different places. It, it's a kind of, it's a really weird experience. Um, totally cool, but it, it's, but you want to be at the point where you're at one with that, right? you know, as a performer. Um, so that's the same thing when you're, you know, kind of like grounding yourself and meditating. You know, you have to learn to throw out all the extraneous stuff and just be comfortable. And it's okay if you, you go off, you know, a little bit, but you know how to come back to, you know, to your center. And that's the same thing for a performer um, to be able to come back, you know, and, and not lose your focus that way. Um, and that way your audience also, you know, has a clear view of what's happening. That's amazing. When you, when you hear music in your, in your mind, does it sound, um, 
say just as clear or is it like you can break down all the components just as clearly as if you were listening to it on a on a stereo system or listening to it live mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean you know what i have to do is i have to often remind myself that i have at least two modes of listening one is just as an audience member okay just experience it don't critique it <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. Uh, um, you know, and then the other one is when I'm sitting there analyzing it, you know, so I have to remind myself, I have to make a conscious decision if I'm at a concert, you know, to say, just enjoy this piece, just listen to it as if it's for the first time, you know, don't critique what they're doing, you know, don't say, oh, I do this differently, you know, so I, I, I do have to make that conscious effort. And I'm sure I'm not the only one amongst my colleagues who has to do that, but to understand that that's what's happening, because I find that after a while, you know, when I was so much in the mode of like intently listening and and analyzing that I wasn't enjoying. Yeah. It's like you know, that. I, it's, it's the balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yet as a teacher, I have to teach my students how to listen to themselves critically. Um, you know, and that's very that's challenging because, you know, uh, these days it's easier, you know, back when, when I was a student, can't tell you how many cassettes I, I, I killed, you know, cause I'd <laughs> always record myself. So I, I'd have an idea and, and just imagine then, I mean, the quality was, eh, you know, yeah. but, um, but at least I could tell basic things like, did I play the wrong notes? Did I play the right rhythms? Things like that. You know, did I play generally the right dynamics? Okay. Um, now, you know, quality even on your phone is much better than that was. So I always tell my students to record themselves. So that way I said, it won't lie. It gives you, you know, a pretty honest, you know, uh, estimation of where you're at. So, so I'm like, so, you know, you may think you played something slowly, but it was actually three times faster. Hmm. Um, so, so to get one to learn to, to listen critically to, to yourself, um, you know, because that also means that, you know, sometimes you're practicing to practice to to um, acquire a skill or to be able to um, overcome a challenge and an obstacle. And then there are other times that you're playing just for your own enjoyment because you love the sound mm -hmm. and you love the music. Um, you know, so that's also, you know, I think goes right in line with, you know, actively listening and, and um, enjoying or actively listening and analyzing. Yeah, I'm still uh, that you are you are incredible. I mean, that's just I'm still <laughs> amazed that you have like I didn't I've never asked a musician that right. Like so, I'm I'm just amazed that you have that ability to hear all of that music in your head so like with essentially the same clarity and precision as when you're when you're listening to it live. Like that just mm -hmm. has to be. I, I don't, I can't even imagine, like, I can imagine what that's like, but I'm just, I'm just amazed by that. That's just, that has to be a lot of fun to be able to do that. Oh, it is, you know, and it's, you know, I would think anybody with a musical, you know, background, um, you know, uh, you know, is, is, has that ability. What, you know, what I come, what I, the parallel that I can draw is like going to um, an art exhibit with an artist. You know, and they understand how those brush strokes are done, you know, and the technique involved and the layering and, and things like that, where for me, I certainly appreciate it, you know, and I can understand that different things, but I, I don't, I can't look at it and say, oh, can you see the layering of the paint there? Um, I can't see that. Like, you know, friends of mine who are art historians who are trained, you know, to, to just look at that and they can... You know, it, it was a fast, it was really, truly a fascinating experience to be educated by, you know, an art historian going through the Monet exhibit um, in, in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts. And we've seen these, you know, the water lilies, all of this, we've seen this so many times, but to see them that close and then to be walking with somebody who can show you and explain the evolution of the style, that's what, you know, I said, this is like what I do in a concert. This is what this person is doing for me in a museum. That's fantastic. So how, how as, as people who don't have that capacity and just want to enjoy music and appreciate it more, how do we 
you know, how do you approach us and, and teach us and what can we learn when we're sitting down and listening to music? Do we, should we do a little bit of background reading on a piece, maybe watch, a, watch some concerts like, or is it just about, like for me, what got me into classical music was just figuring out the emotion that that piece brought out in me and then exploring that emotion as I listened again and again and again. Yeah, that, you know, I, because, you know, music just gets to your soul. Um, I, I, that's the approach that I take. It's like, you know, your first listening, you know, how did that make you feel? You know, what were the emotions? Then after that, you know, I'll often, you know, I'll say to a friend, you know, who's new to it, I'll say, then after that, read about it and then come back and listen to it again. You know, because, you know, your first impression is what's gonna stay with you, you know, cause that, that, you know, there's nothing like that. The first time, I still remember the first time I, I heard um, the Sibelius Second Symphony, you know, um, I'm a pianist, so I only play piano music, but to hear the Sibelius Second Symphony, you know, being played live by my friends, there was nothing like that. That was just such a unique experience. And still to this day, when I hear that piece, I go back to that time. It's created that memory for me, you know, and I will crank it up in, my, you know, wherever I'm listening to when I hear it come on. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I'll probably be, I'm probably the only person that the highway patrol would pull, pull over for speeding. And if they ask me what I'm listening to or what, you know, what was it? I'll be, Sibelius second did it to me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, or Rachmaninoff third piano concerto, sorry, I got carried away, <laughs> I floored it. <laughs> You know, um, but you know, it, it's those experiences that you know I, I want people to 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 um, hang on to, and then after that, learn about it, and then and when you do, then you're all the more you fall more in love with it because you're like, oh, I didn't realize this. Then you go back and listen to it again, you know, and then that begins that whole cycle. You know, um, it seems to me if you uh, if you would approach it the other way, like read about it first. It's too much of a chore, yep. you know. It, it, it's it it's not anything spontaneous, and and music certainly can bring that out. It can reach us and bring us to places that we never thought possible. Absolutely true. It can, you know, uh, you know. There's so many great quotes about what music can do for us, and and all of them are true. You know, it can, you know, put us on an incredible high. Um, other times it can remind us of some pretty horrible times, um, but it's all cathartic. Yep. Um, you know, and so I, I think that it, it's, you know, you were talking earlier, you said earlier, you know, we're so busy um, as a society. And it's true um, that, you know, maybe that's also why classical music, you know, has fewer listeners because it does take time. It's not instant gratification. It is instant gratification if you're open to it. But for you to understand it, you know, it, you have to go a little bit further. Um, and uh, as a society, we don't do that. You know, we want things kind of handed to us on a silver platter. Yeah. I think we can also look at it. And you're right. Everything you said about music, it's it's gotten me through tough times it's made me appreciate so much of my life more than I would have like it's done so many things for me but I think if we look if we stop and analyze it and say if we treat it as a hobby like what does that really mean if you see if you study people who get into let's just say cars for example mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. they don't know everything about you know how that engine is built and the suspension of the car like but they'll, they'll get a taste for it. Maybe it's through a fast car, maybe it's through a beautiful car, and then they wanna learn more. And then as they learn more, they get to appreciate what these unbelievable car manufacturers are bringing to the table. And then they can mm -hmm. get, they, it just, the excitement kind of feeds itself over time. And if we yes. approach, I think we should approach music the same way is like, mm -hmm. did this resonate with me emotionally? Did I get something did I yeah. feel something profound out of it or strong? Like, right, let right. me go explore that more rather than just clicking to mm -hmm. the next to the next song. Right, exactly. And you know, um, you know, we again as a society, we don't always like to self reflect. Yeah. You know, and and so that's where you know it it's just taking that you know extra time to stop and ask yourself 
those questions. Um, you know, and to be open to that. Um, you know, and I, I find, you know, it, it's interesting because as as the teacher uh, and working with my now their their high school students, um, you know, it's just fascinating because you know, oftentimes you think of teens, you know, they, they don't want to talk with adults. But, you know, because my students and I, of course, share that bond of, of piano music, you know, they, they want to talk about it, they want to talk about their experiences with it, they have questions to ask, you know, that's exciting. And, and so not only, you know, has this music um, fulfilled their lives, it also opens them up, opens up a person to have these conversations and to realize certain aspects of their character, you know, that maybe they didn't realize were there. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's what, um, you know, it, it's never ending, you know, and, and maybe I just draw too many parallels in my life because it's, it is my life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you do. I but, think you're. I think you're right. I, I think that's exactly right. We're we're there's more potential for more people to experience that though, and it makes me like that's why I, that's why we're here, right? We want right. more people to be able to experience that because yeah. it's had such an impact on our lives. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, you know, and and we had this conversation briefly, you know, it it's like when you hear the rumble of the bass you know, the bass tones, right? In a, in a, you know, in, in a really good system, right? Yeah. Um, there's no experience like that, you know? Um, even something as simple as like, you know, watching the Star Wars movies for me, you know? It's like, I will sit there, I'll get my sound bar set up, you know? And I'll just be like ready to crank because you want to feel that. You want to, it, it, it brings you in, it invites you. Uh, and I think if people realize that, you know, you get a little bit of that in the movie theater. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you make, if, if we're going to spend, you know, uh, a nice chunk of change on, you know, high definition TV, the sound has to be compatible. Yeah. Because that's only one aspect of it. Yeah. Then you'll get the full experience of it i mean um i i think i told you this i i went to um lord of the rings i heard it live with the live orchestra that was the entire audience i mean you could really feel the tension you could feel you know the battle scenes just because the music was there and the overtones were hitting you you know as convenient as digitization has been you know, and compress, it's compressed those sounds and those crackles, you know, we talked about this with LPs, um, that give the, the sound and, and the sonic experience its personality. Yep. You know, where, you know, it, it, just like with food, it becomes bland, right? So, you know, by investing in, you know, if you're going to, and I, I feel very strongly about this, you know, if you're going to invest in high definition, you know, visual video, then you should, you know, do the same in audio so that you have the same experience. Absolutely. I agree. No, of course. I mean, I, yes, I, it's, it's interesting that when you, when you look at music, like we're also, we're a very visual culture. Maybe we've mm -hmm. been that way for a long time. Um, I recognize the importance of, of that, of the visuals, but yes, for me anyways as a human being most of the emotion is in the audio it's especially in the music it's the yeah. it's that sweeping you know orchestra yeah. at the just yeah. that emotional the, the most yeah. poignant emotional moment that's what puts you over the top it's not it's not like you know uh you know brad pitt crying on screen right it's it's right the whole, right yeah yeah it's exactly whole thing. it's the whole yes yeah, the whole package together. yeah yeah i mean when right. i think about it how many great classical you know uh, pieces of classical music are, are still being used in movies you know because of that sweeping you know phrase um you know you even listen to it now you know with great movie soundtracks you know back in the day you know when they had orchestras for the studios yeah you know, the music was 
different. Um, even, you know, as you go to Broadway, you know, and, and stuff like that, it's an entirely different experience to have live, you know, um, or as close to, you know, in an audio experience as possible. Um, because I, I think that just makes for a complete experience. It really does. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, where do you think, so I, I know you, you work with Steinway and Sons now, mm -hmm. and the brand is obviously so well known and mm -hmm. such a magnificent piano. What do you think Steinway is doing so well to communicate the value of that piano and what it can do and, and musical appreciations that the other that other people aren't doing? Like, what is the, what is the, you know, how does that happen, right? Because Ste Steinway right. is like, it still has a special place. It's still almost, I think, you know, untouched reputation wise and sound wise. What, mm -hmm. what are you guys doing so correctly? Well, I think it's just, we've always been true to our mission, which is to build the best piano. Um, you know, it's the gold standard. Um, and we continue to, you know, we, we, we haven't ever, you know, we don't rest on our laurels. So we continually innovate and improve to make today's Steinway the best Steinway. You know, it's, a, it's a, the recipe remains the same for the most part, um, you know, but there are things that we will just not um, uh, cut corners on because we know that that is the essence of a Steinway. So it's that legacy of being the gold standard of piano makers, um, of live continually day, day in, day out, living to that standard, as well as continuing to innovate and improve for today, you know, to make today's Steinway the best Steinway. Um, you know, again, that, that takes a lot of self-reflection as a company um, and to understand where, you know, it's like there are certain things that we just not are not gonna compromise on, um, you know, in terms of material, quality of material, because we know that that is what makes a Steinway a Steinway. Um, and okay. to be aligned with a brand like that, you know, that's been doing this for what, you know, 168 years is inspiring. Um, so, you know, I, do you remember the first time you played on a Steinway? I do. I do. Um, I, again, my first piano teacher really spoiled me. You know, she made me a Steinway baby because she had Steinways herself. You know, she always said, she goes, I'm not very rich in money. She said, but I'm piano rich. <laughs> well, she wasn't kidding. She had five pianos in her home. Wow. Okay. So she had two pianos in her living room, a Steinway and a Baldwin. She had an upright in her bedroom, a, a Hamilton upright in her bedroom. And then in her garage, which was not really a garage, a piano studio, she had another Steinway and a Steinway upright. So, um, it, so I was exposed was on a Steinway and I just kind of remember you know I went from toy piano upright and I was like cool what's this you know <laughs> it's like driving the Ferrari you know except for I didn't have a license yet <laughs> you know I was like wow and then of course she saw you know after a certain point she's the one who said you know she needs a bigger box of crayons you need to get her a Steinway too and my parents you know heeded her advice uh, made the investment. And actually, that's the piano I have here with me in New York. It, uh, I've traveled with it. Wow. So I, I grew up in Southern California. And that was the piano I played until I went to New York. And then um, later on, um, that piano came here. Hmm. That's incredible. Does that piano still? So why? Why? I, I'm assuming you played on different Steinways, but oh, that yeah. mm -hmm. right, but that piano your Steinway is obviously it's still special to you. So it's all yeah. those it's all those emotions that it still brings to the table, right? When yeah, you, exactly. When you go and perform. 
Yeah. And I know, you know, my Steinway is, you know, over 50 years old and, and I know how to get the sound that I want. Do I love the Steinways that I play at work? Oh, absolutely. Would I love one of those at home? Yes, I would. Um, but this one, you know, it, it, she's an old friend. You know, seen me through a lot, watched me grow. You know, we've grown alongside each other. That That's, you know, that's the special relationship I have with it. I mean, you talk, it's beautiful. You talk about it almost as if it's, uh, almost as if it's alive. It's a part of you. Yeah. It is, you know, it really is. Um, you know, it's a member of the family. You know, probably knows a lot more than a lot of people know about me because it's seen me through some, sometimes, you know, just kind of like I've been frustrated with it. I've been, you know, joyous with it. You know, she's put, through, she's been put through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but she still continues to make music with me. That's and that's, awesome. yeah, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. Um, you know, and it, it's great again, you know, now that hopefully, you know, with opening up, um, you know, being able to do more live performances, it's just, you know, I think everybody has appreciated it more. I mean, I think this is also, you know, despite the fact that we may have our issues with live streaming and, and, and sound quality and stuff like that, I find it interesting how many people clung were clinging to any sort of, you know, kind of live streamed performance yeah. during the past year and a half. Um, you know, so my hope is, is that that will fuel and ignite, you know, uh, people's desire to want to hear more of it. You know, this pandemic I think, you know, certainly classical music, um, you know, all types, but in particular classical music. So I'm, my hope is that, you know, with people being able to listen to it in their living rooms and, and also that, that, you know, they were in my living room listening to me play my piano, <laughs> that, you know, that sense of that personal level, I hope, um, you know, will continue to fuel people's, you know, passion uh, to want to learn more about it and to listen, you know, and to make that a priority. Absolutely. There's, again, there's just so much, um, there's so much to explore and experience and appreciate if we can just, like you said, slow down and ground ourselves and let that, let that experience happen. That's all, mm -hmm. that's all that's missing is just, we have to let it happen. Yeah. It's like, you know, going to the beach and watching the, the waves crash on the shore, you know, and not necessarily go into it, but just watch it, yep. you know, and experiencing that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, silence, the quiet is music in itself, you know, so I, I think it does require for us to kind of have a little bit of a, a, a shift in terms of our daily activities, but it, it's so worth it and it's so rewarding, you know, that I, I think people will find that um, being able to take that time to listen to music, to listen to classical music, to learn about it, even just a little bit, you know, um, there's something in there for everybody, I feel. Maybe I'm being yeah, Pollyanna-ish. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. And I, I just think it's also, it's so... It's refreshing to see um, artists like yourself, like being being so open and willing to to share and communicate and let us in, right? And say like, yes, come experience this. That's yeah. You don't see that with musicians, or at least it's been no. a while. It's been a yeah. while. Yeah. yeah, and 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 that's what it's really. You know, it's. I mean, one of the things again, my my first piano teacher. It's, it's not about us, the performer. We are the vessel that communicates the composer's message. Um, that was pretty heady stuff to tell like an eight-year-old. I had no clue what she meant by that, you know? But she said it to me all the time. And so when you take yourself out of the equation as the performer and you see yourself just, you know, the vessel by which this comes out, it, it frames it differently. And I think that's when your audience also 
feels it differently because they feel that you're giving something to them. You're sharing something with them that it's not just like here, <laughs> this is dinner, you know, eat what I, eat what I give you. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, absolutely. You're sharing, you're sharing something with them, but you're sharing something that means so much to you with them, right? You're sure you right. all the all the training, all the practice, all the right. studying, like this really matters to you and you're sharing it, you're sharing it with people generously. That's that's magic. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and just you know, you want this is such great music, you want it to live on. You know, so it's it's really, you know, we're we're just basically you know, the, the vessels by which the music gets communicated. So my, my last question for you, Karen, uh, you've yeah. been super mm -hmm. generous with your time. Um, do you have a favorite piano piece? And, and yeah. what, what is it about that piece that makes it, makes it your favorite? Or maybe it's a top three, maybe you can't pick. You know, it, it, it varies for me, often depending upon the day. I, I am, you know, and I wasn't very comfortable with this, with impressionistic music when I was younger. And, um, you know, and then I also wasn't very comfortable with um, Spanish music, music by Defaya, Albanis, Granados. And I will say these days, those are some of my favorite pieces to play. Um, and, and I think it was just because of experience, cultural experience. I, I traveled there and all of a sudden it, it all made sense to me. I'm like, oh, I get it. So in my head, as I play it, you know, so anything by, you know, Albanis, Granados, you know, Defaya um, and, and Debussy, I, I, I have the vision in my head of what it was like walking through those alleys, you know? So I want to recreate that for my audience, you know? And, um, you know, and also I think a lot of it comes with just age, you know, it's like, I'm not learning to pass a test. I'm playing for me and, you know, my audience, you know, I'm not programming because I have to do this. Yeah. So I think those, those two aspects, you know, um, you know, I, I still, of course, love playing Mozart, you know, Chopin and stuff like that. But recently, you know, friends said to me, you know, do you think you're going to be a specialist in, in Spanish music? I said, I don't know. I just kind of think that's what I'm into right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's very you know, cool. Like you said, it never, it never stops. It just keeps giving. Yeah. 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 You know, I, there were pieces I read. And, and the last thing I remember there were, there was a piece that my piano teacher in New York gave me and, and I learned it dutifully you know, and it was the Chopin D flat major nocturne and I played it, I played it okay, I played it well, but I never felt 100% comfortable with it. And then I didn't touch it for, for literally probably 30 years. And then one day recently, this spring, I opened up the nocturnes, I was looking for stuff for my students and I came across it. So I read through it and all of a sudden it made sense to me. And everything that he was trying to tell me to do or wanted, you know, to teach me, it all came together, you know, and I was like, I get it. That, that moment was just, you know, I, I felt like I had climbed Mount Everest, you know, in this tiny little nocturne. I was like, I struggled with sound and how to project this. And, and then I played it, you know, and I finally got it to work. And I was like, that's it. You know, it was like, you know, everything fit correctly. Um, you know, so you you never stop learning. That's remarkable. That, that's a great story. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there because I don't think we can do better than that. That's uh, perfect. Um, Thank you, Gustavo. Karen, you are a joy. You are so dynamic, so Thank well you. spoken, and it's just, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you for the opportunity. Be well. You too. Okay, thanks.